It's really common to hear the terms fractal and support and resistance used in association with each other. So much so that one of my viewers has asked how to use fractals to identify the support levels at different time scales. The thing is though that the mathematical fractal properties of markets make a nonsense of the concept of support and resistance lines. Or at least it makes it really difficult to come up with the rules about how to find support lines that a beginner could successfully use. This is a bit concerning, so let's take a look at the truth about fractals and support. To do this, we're going to examine what the concept of support and resistance lines is. Then we're going to look at what it means for markets to be fractals. And finally, we're going to examine what the implications are of the fractal characteristics of markets for support and resistance as a trading method. So just to recall what support and resistance lines are, if we have a stock price chart, what we're meant to do is look at levels where the price has changed direction. The theory is that these are lines where traders in the market have decided that they will either start buying at a particular price, which is the support level, or start selling at a particular price, which is the resistance level. What you often hear in the advice about how to use this as a trading method is that you should draw many such support lines and try to get these to go through as many peaks and troughs as you can. Once you have done this, you can use these to either implement a buy low sell high strategy or alternatively use what is effectively a method of trend following such that when the price either breaks above or below a support line, the assumption becomes that having broken this line, the price will keep going in this direction until a new support or resistance level is hit. It's also often said that when it does this, for example, if it breaks above a resistance line, then we are told that that resistance line now becomes the new support line. So we can imagine the stock price moving up and down like layers of a cake. This sounds fantastic in theory, and as such, it's very seductive for people who are just beginners to trading. But it gets a lot harder when we look at a real world example. It's pretty common advice when you are drawing these lines to try to zoom out from the market a little, i.e. try to look at it on longer timescales. This chart is plotted over a period of around 450 days, so approaching two years worth of data. But even at this timescale, you can see that the peaks aren't often nicely clustered together on the same level and that there are a lot of singletons so that it starts to become subjective where you should draw these lines. For example, are two peaks together enough? Should these peaks be separated by a long period of time? And should you use or ignore periods of small fluctuations? So what we need to realize here is that it's really important to understand that support levels aren't some really scientific method that you can apply with 100% accuracy to determine where buyers or sellers will step in and that you could do this perfectly if only you knew just the right method. Rather, a much better way of thinking about this is that it's just some line that you choose as a trader where you think there is buying support for a stock based on past behavior or alternatively how high you think it is likely to go. Obviously the behavior of the market isn't random so it's not unreasonable to think that looking at a chart of past price behavior might give you some idea of how the price will behave in the future. If we accept that premise we can then ask how might the theory of fractals and their application to financial markets help us. It's important too that we remember what fractals are and what they are not. Fractals are structures that display ever more detail as you zoom in on them. So as we can see here, large scale fluctuations have superimposed upon them smaller fluctuations, which in turn have even smaller fluctuations superimposed on them. Unlike abstract mathematical fractals though, financial markets aren't literally fractals. They just have properties in common with fractals. In particular, financial markets don't literally look the same at all scales as they do at the large scale. Rather, they just have the same statistical properties at different scales. So for example, it's pretty much impossible to tell what scale financial market data is unless you can see the x-axis. What some commentators have claimed with fractals is that because they have these self-similar properties, there should be repeating patterns in fractals. Even though it can certainly look that way, such as the case for the two structures we have circled here, there's no theoretical reason to expect fractals to repeat themselves. And structures like this can be explained simply in terms of the interaction between trends and the degree of volatility in the market at a certain point of time. There's another use of the term fractals which really has nothing to do with the proper mathematical definition of a fractal. 
That's the use of the word fractal in Bill Williams' trading method based on candlesticks and moving averages. He simply calls certain patterns of candlesticks fractals, and that's not what we're talking about here. That's a very different approach and a way of thinking, which I find gets quite convoluted and complicated very quickly, making it difficult to apply, which I personally don't find very helpful and potentially problematic as a method. But if you're interested in that, you should go and look at it yourselves. So having gotten out of the way what fractals aren't, let's move on and see how fractal ideas can be applied to trading based on charts. The self-similar nature of stock market data also implies that when we zoom in on the market and look at shorter time periods, we see mainly small fluctuations in price. And conversely, if we zoom out and look at the longer time scale, we start to see more large fluctuations. So we expect to see on a chart plot that on a shorter time scale, which we should take to mean less than a year, although it could be longer or shorter depending on the particular stock or market we are looking at, that there simultaneously exist multiple scales at which fluctuations occur, and that no one of these scales is special, and the fluctuations can be of any size and not directly dependent on any past levels. You can think of these scales as being driven by the kind of self-organizing market behavior where we have buyers and sellers who are continuously responding to each other's actions. At this scale, the dynamics are far more reactive and less driven by the fundamentals of the stock. Conversely, over the longer term, we expect to see trends become apparent and that the price will be more driven by the fundamentals. So if we look at a long period of financial market data, we find that we could zoom in on places where we could fit support and resistance lines on some small part of the chart, or we could zoom out and put them on larger parts of the chart. But we can see when we take too small an area that the usefulness of these support and resistance lines disappears very rapidly the first time a big movement comes along. That's why generally commentators on this sort of method advise us to use longer periods. One interesting thing though is that if we did choose to zoom in on one quite small spot on a chart, light might be relevant for day trading then when the chart does happen to strike one of these larger moves it's going to move very far very quickly outside of the support or resistance level so there may be some reason to think that when you are focused on these small time scales that that kind of method might work quite well of course things happen so quickly that it's much more difficult to exploit movements on these time scales unless you have really good trading access available to you but i think the basic problem when you don't use long enough time scales is that you will be constantly having to reset your support and resistance lines because the market at that scale is more driven by fluctuations and can be moving very quickly in one direction or another so it's meaningless to try to draw such lines due to the rapidly changing nature of the market at the other end of scales over the very long term and here we have a chart that is nearly 10 years worth of data we have the opportunity to clearly see trends for your support and resistance lines to have validity you really need to know what these trends are what's also interesting about this particular chart is that there are clearly periods where something has happened to break this trend such as for the two areas we've circled in red here this brings up another really important point which is that regardless of the particular method you're basing your trading on it's really handy to understand the fundamentals underlying the price movements of a stock in fact this is by far and away the most useful thing you can combine with any other methods that you're trying to use to determine a support and resistance level these things themselves aren't necessarily predictable but you can at least use the company's own forecasts or those of broking firms even better if you understand that company well and its business so let's go ahead and see how well what we've been saying matches with the practical experience of trying to draw support and resistance lines on a chart here we're using 200 days worth of data from another stock we can see here that there are certainly some dips and peaks that seem to sit on a consistent line but this isn't the case for all the dips and peaks and we do see the price wander above and below these lines Consequently, we see in this chart that there's no real reason to think that gains and losses need to go up and down in these discrete jumps between bands of support, as they certainly don't appear to here. I would suggest then that there is a high degree of subjectivity in the way that most traders set these lines. And as we said before, this really isn't a scientific process. I would guess that highly experienced traders know how to set these lines and combine them with other technical analysis methods 
in a way in which their experience tells them this is useful to do and which has worked for them in the past. And much more importantly, what the limitations of these approaches are. If you're a new trader, my advice would be not to use these lines too literally, but as a bit of a guide to support other information. If we zoom out a bit so that now we're looking at 600 data points where we have circled the area we had previously zoomed in on, we can see how useful or rather how irrelevant the lines we previously drew were. If we take this bottom line as our starting point, it touches on these three peaks here. And I guess this does have some useful qualities to it because it has identified where we have fallen through a support level beyond which we see the stock price continue to fall. What's perhaps not so useful from this is what happens next. So where do we draw the next support level? You see there's a dip here, but then this next step is all the way down here. And then the next step after that is down here. And as it turns out, the stock falls further again after initially looking like it might be settling on a new support level. Conversely, if we were to look at the line at the top, which is a resistance line, it isn't much use to us because even though it hits a few peaks, there are periods where the price has gone above this level and gone back down below again. So it's not really clear how the approach of drawing a resistance line here has helped. But we can see that the principal problem in finding a resistance line is just getting enough peaks that are aligned in order to justify drawing a resistance line at any particular level. Before we get to the summary, actively trading the stock market is inherently risky. You should get some professional advice before considering doing so. And I'm not proposing that you go and use these ideas for trading. In fact, you're probably better off passively investing. I hope though that these ideas are interesting and useful even to passive investors. So a summary of the key ideas here. First off, look at the long-term trends. Secondly, understand the fundamentals of the stock. Thirdly, Recognize short time frames will be more volatile and less predictable. Fourthly, understand that there are no special scales which dictate that prices need to follow patterns of support and resistance.